Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi and welcome to our second session of Islamic Authors with myself, Sam Al Azami, and I'm delighted to have with uh, me today uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown, or Professor Jonathan Brown, as we'd say, um, a, a dear friend, but also uh, one of the, in my estimation, uh, most interesting scholars in the field of Islamic studies in terms of just the uh, sheer range of topics that he covers, and we'll be discussing, inshallah, his. Uh, recent book, Slavery and Islam. Um, and uh, just a, a brief introduction to um, uh, Professor Brown, uh, who will be well known to a lot of our viewers. Um, he's currently the Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization uh, in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Um, he has uh, he got his PhD at the University of Chicago, an extremely well-traveled scholar. Uh, and extremely well published scholar uh, who's written on topics from hadith studies to Quranic studies to early Islamic history uh, to all sorts of uh, uh, sort of uh, fascinating topics um, including the uh, controversial uh, which uh, basically covers today's topic um, so inshallah the standard format will be um, uh, I will uh, allow um, Professor Brown to cover this topic uh, if you'll sort of uh, I I know um, Jonathan Brown for a long time, so I, I will uh, go ahead and call you Jack if that's all right. <laughs> that's fine. So, Jack, <laughs> inshallah. Um, so Jack will inshallah be covering this topic for um, maybe about ten minutes, just giving an, us an idea of what um, motivated him to write the book and, in a sense, what the main themes of the book are. Um, after which, uh, I will launch into a discussion in the standard way, uh, and that discussion will go on for at least half an hour. Um, and if anyone has any questions, we'll try and cover those questions towards the end of our discussion. Um, uh, Jack has been very kind to suggest that uh, if we find that the discussion is going on uh, over an hour and there is interest uh, on the part of the viewers, that we could potentially go on for a bit longer, um, depending on your circumstances, of course, Jack. And I understand you're sort of, uh, you know, you have other responsibilities as well, as we all do. Um, so please, uh, you know, please feel free to let me actually before I um, sort of uh, let you take it uh, take things over. Um, I do I want to emphasize people are free to write in questions. Um, they will come up to us as comments, and you can also um, I would encourage you all to buy the book. Um, and there's a link that's present uh, in the uh, either the video description on YouTube or on the uh, sort of. Um, the post on Facebook um, and uh, inshallah uh, you know I, I think that this is really an extraordinary work um, that a lot of people should be reading so um, please uh, do consider buying it and uh, we uh, with that uh, let me ask uh, Jack to go ahead Bismillah. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me basically by the way everything I say now is actually in the book so um, if you're interested in more, you know, reading it instead of hearing it, you can find it in the book. But uh, when I was, um, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I first became Muslim, it was probably about ni 19 years old. And I, at some point I, early on, I remember I was reading the translation of the Quran, and I came across a verse in the Surah al the verse uh, Surah 16, that uh, where God compares, you know, a um, uh, abd, mamlukun la ala, la ala wa, um, and then so a slave who's owned that cannot do anything versus someone who God has given like good sustenance to right and this is this is actually a parable of you know people who call on false gods versus call on the, the God right so false gods are like slaves that are can't do anything right and um and I was struck, I mean, I remember being struck because I, I was like, wait a second, you know, like, you can't just mention slavery, like, you have to say something about how slavery is wrong, like, you can't just talk about slavery. And then it wasn't even saying, you know, uh, go get a slave or do this with a slave. Or that. It, was, it was just mentioning it as a parable, like, as a sense, you know, as a, as a f figuratively, you know, figuratively. So that I was like, well, that's kind of a, I don't really understand. But um, anyway, it wasn't a big deal. I think that like a, maybe like a lot of Muslims, uh, you know, you know that the Quran talks about slavery, slavery talks about freeing slaves a lot, right? Um, but you know, you can. It's not really a, a big issue that comes up a lot for at least for me, it wasn't. Um, so uh, then, of course, so I you know, went out of my my mind. 
But then when the uh, ISIS thing happened, right, um, there was this, you know, a lot of these newspaper articles came out, uh, like in the New York Times, um, you know, ISIS and the theology of rape and everything. Although it turns out actually that some of the reporting on that was, uh, was inaccurate. Uh, the reporter is, it was you know, basically reprimanded Making for up that. Stuff. Yeah, or just, yeah, like basically it was, you know, not, there was stuff that was not um, well authenticated. So anyway, the, uh, you know, that was a, a, became a really big issue. A lot of Muslims were, you know, they were in shock because like, here's all these guys saying that they're following the Quran and the Sunnah and they're enslaving, you know, Yazidis and Christians and other people in, in Iraq and Syria. And, um, you know, and they're saying like, well, this is in the Quran, this is in the Hadith, this is in the Sharia. So what's the big deal? You know, um, and Muslims didn't really know how to answer that. Uh, and some of the responses were by Muslim scholars like, well, there's, you know, consensus that slavery has been prohibited. It's like, well, OK, so what? So a bunch of people today say something, but I'm telling you, I'm following the Quran, the Sunnah. And, you know, what's your answer that today we decide we're not going to do that? That doesn't really seem like an answer. So it was a really big issue for a lot of Muslims. And I, I mean, I completely understand. Uh, so I was I really wanted to deal with this topic kind of and try and answer these questions. Um, and I guess that the main question in, in the book, it, sort of the that throughout the book is, what do you do when the source that you consider to be morally authoritative seems to allow something that you consider morally reprehensible? So how do you deal with that? Like, how do you even make sense of your feeling of moral reprehensibility? Like, how do I, if I'm Muslim and I'm supposed to fo follow the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, um, and they know best, why is it that I feel so strongly that slavery is wrong? So first of all, why do I have that feeling? How do I make sense of that? Second of all, how do I make sense that my feeling contradicts these authoritative sources? And what does that mean about the, the, the the kind of truth value of those sources or those ability, the ability of those sources to offer me guidance. Um, so that's a, a huge question. Now, of course, I was writing this book at the same time as this uh, uh, protest took place in Charlottesville, I think it was 2017, about taking down the statue of Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson uh, had slaves. Thomas Jefferson had a uh, slave concubine that he had children with, Sally Hemming. And um, uh, George Washington had slaves. And this whole idea that George Washington was like, you know, ah, he didn't want to have slaves, he freed them all. This, there's a book I recommend reading called uh, Never Caught about Ona Judge, who was a slave uh, girl, a girl who was enslaved, you know, from her parents were slaves, of the Washington family. She ran away when the Washingtons were in Philadelphia. And they spent the rest of their lives uh, hunting for her. Like they, they are always trying to get her back. So this idea that they, they didn't just say, oh, it's fine. It's, it's good. She's good. It's good. She left. You know, we wanted to free her anyway. No, 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 no. Not at all. So and it, when this happened, you know, it was funny because uh, Donald Trump came out and sort of said what I more succinctly than I could, I could brought up this, this point, which is he said, OK, George Washington is a slave owner. Are you going to take down the statues of George Washington? Are you going to rename everything in America that's named Washington, which is pretty much everything? And here, this was the the crux of the what, what I was interested in, right? Which is that um, that's what I call a slavery conundrum, right? So you have three axioms, and you can't really reject any of them. Maybe you can, but we'll talk about that. You can, can't really reject any of them, but you also can't hold all three of those axioms at the same time. So it's a it's a conundrum. The first axiom is that slavery is a intrinsic and gross evil throughout the time. So, and this is all stuff that now we you know know this is these are fixed points of inquiry. These are axiomatic in our society. So slavery is evil. It was evil. It's evil today. It was evil 100 years ago. It's evil 1,000 years ago. It's evil 2,000 years ago. Evil 3,000 years ago. Right. Um and. If you want to say that that's not not axiomatic, try going into any kind of social setting and saying that slavery was actually OK 200 years ago or something. See what will happen. And then, you know, we'll talk later. The second maxim is that all slavery is slavery. So uh, there's no such thing as like good slavery, bad slavery. You can't say, yeah, Thomas Jefferson had slaves, but like he was a really nice guy. So he treated them well. No, no, there's no such thing as 
you know, any type of slavery is unacceptable. Slavery is a gross and intrinsic moral evil throughout space and time. Two, all slavery is slavery. Three, our past has some kind of moral or even legal claim over us. Right? So we look to our past for guidance. Maybe we look to our past for strict rules. Um, now, here's the problem. If you look at human heritage, so the heritage of human beings, prior to, let's say, the year 1690, prior to the year 1690, in all of world history, I know of one, two, three people. In all of human history, I don't mean in like the West, I don't mean, I mean in everywhere that, we, that I know of, three people who said that slavery in and of itself is evil, is a, is a moral evil. Not enslaving the wrong people, not treating your slaves badly, I mean that is slavery in and of itself is an evil. Can you so mention this, the, people? <laughs> yeah, uh, one is uh, Gregory of Nyssa. He's a, a bishop, one of the church fathers, a bishop from Cappadocia. He died in 394, I think, of the common era. Uh, the other one is um, uh, Jean Baudin. He's a French uh, jurist and historian and kind of man about town, Renaissance man. He died in yeah. 1596, if I'm not mistaken. And the third one is a German jurist named A.K. von Repgau, who in the, I think he's in the early 1300s, if I'm not mistaken. He wrote a book called the Saxon Spiegel, the, the Saxon Mirror, which is, I think, one of the earliest books, kind of Germanic law books. Um, and he basically repeats uh, Gregory of Nice's arguments uh, well, with a little bit of adjustment. Um, so that's it. So. Here's the thing, right? Now, look, if um, people who are saying, like, we should take down the statue of Thomas Jefferson, people are saying we should take down the statue of that guy in Bristol, people who are saying we should, you know, change the name of this building or that building because this guy was involved in the slave trade, they're completely right. They are totally correct. Logically speaking, they are completely correct. Slavery is a gross and intrinsic evil across space and time. All slavery is slavery. If you're involved in that, if you're involved in the gro a gross and intrinsic evil throughout space and time, something that's so horrific, no one can countenance it. Why would you ever honor that person? Why would you ever look to that person for guidance? I mean, Osama, do you take advice from people who think slavery is okay? <laughs> do you take, do you ask them like, I don't know what I should do in this situation or uh, you know, I don't know what I should do. What do I do ethically? Right. You know, tell me about God. No, we would. It's ridiculous. They're completely correct. But here's the problem. It means you're going to take at the least, at the very least, all of human history prior to 1690 into the garbage can. That's it. And then, you know, then we can talk about the 1700s, 1800s, whatever. You know, uh, we can talk about Thomas Jefferson, and all these other people. But. At the very least, every single philosophical tradition of note that I know, of, every religion that I know of, all were either condoned slavery, had no problem with slavery, maybe defended slavery, thought it was totally normal. So what do you do? That's a big that's a big predicament. Some people might be willing to pay that cost. Some people might. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Let's get rid of all of human heritage before 1700. Why not? If it's if it's if it's evil, it's evil. Get rid of it. But very, I, not a lot of people are willing to, to pay that cost. And certainly, people who look to revealed traditions that come from, you know, the, the classical period or whatever, the axial age or after, they wouldn't usually be willing to pay that. So that's um, that's the main kind of issue I'm wrestling with in the book. I took, but anyway, I'll, I'll summarize the book really quickly now. So the first Please. chapter is yeah. I talk about uh, kind of talk about definition of slavery. And the main point I'm trying to make there is that uh, really when you define slavery, it's a very political action. And it's a lot of things. It's about defining kind of what you think slavery is as opposed to what, you know, other people might do. Right. So it's, a, it's about kind of saying who matters, who's suffering matter, who's suffering doesn't matter. Now, um, uh, there is no agreed upon definition of slavery. That's not necessarily a problem 
right? So there's no agreed upon definition of religion. You, you know, you and I are sort of in religious studies and there's no agreed upon definition of religion, religious studies. But that's not a big deal because if you say religion is this or that, no one says you're an evil person. Hmm. But here's the problem with things like terrorism and slavery, these words that are not, not agreed upon in terms of their definition. Uh, but if you are guilty of those things, you become kind of, uh, you have been cast out of the, 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 the circle of, of, discursibility or thinkability right? right then that's the problem right so when these these definitions are both uh there's a there's a degree of subjectivity there's a problem with subjectivity there but also they're used as these um they can be used as moral cudgels that becomes really problematic the the second chapter looks at the sort of looks at the history uh, sorry slavery and islamic law third chapter is a kind of overview of slavery and islamic civilization then i talk about um uh, the, the ab abolition of slavery in Islam, abolition of slavery in Islam. I give the different approaches Muslims have taken to that. I, I say what I think the best approach is. I have, an, in the next chapter, I look at and analyze their approaches from the problem of the slavery conundrum. And then the last chapter deals with, kind of puts all this together and looks at the issue of, uh, of sex, uh, slave, sex concubines, basically in Islamic law, uh, owners, male owners having sex with female slaves. Right, so very light reading, shall we say? Jazakallah um, uh, I mean, that's a that's a, a a wonderful summary of actually a, a very very sort of um, lengthy work, which uh, will, I think, this may be the longest book you've written. Um, is that is that fair to say? I or? think so. Yeah. And um, uh, but it certainly rewards uh, you know uh, spending the time on it, and indeed sort of reading your extensive footnotes as well. Um, I think you've covered a lot of uh, fascinating terrain in what you've just said, but I want to emphasise to people that, um, as you put it at the outset, this is in the book, but the book has so much more. It's extremely rich. It's extremely well researched. So please do try and uh, you know get your hands on it to be able to read it. Uh, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions, um, and it, uh, uh, viewers are already sort of sending in their questions. So inshallah, we'll try and get to you um, within the next half hour or so. Um, and wa alaikum salam to Samina Awan, who's uh, just given salam to us. Um, why sixteen ninety? What were you mentioning? You were mentioning before sixteen ninety. I just oh, want to be curious. Oh, that's around. There's around when these uh, this one uh, Quaker tract is uh, anti-slavery okay. Quaker tract is written in in Pennsylvania. Right, and uh, you kind of uh, spoke uh, in passing that you know who's going to discard everything before sixteen ninety? Maybe some people will, and I I actually think that uh, you know. The reality is uh, so much of our laws, so much of our sort of like society and culture is so deeply embedded in a history that, you know, sees itself going back to the um, ancient Greeks, for example, or to Magna Carta or what have you. Um, I, our institutions couldn't survive that kind of, um, you know, uh, extirpation, so to speak, of um, history. Um, but I, I think that you, you present the dilemma in a very compelling way. Um, you know, how do you accept moral guidance from a tradition, uh, whether it's religious, in my view, whether it's religious or irreligious, because, um, you know, moral philosophy in the modern world, which is uh, largely secular in the academy, for example, uh, still draws on sort of these kinds of norms that are pre-modern as well, um, even if they're very often critical about them. So, you know, how do you deal with that uh, conundrum? One of the things that I'm curious to sort of uh, and it's, I actually read the book about um, six to eight months ago, and I've gone through sort of certain sections in advance of this meeting. But I'm just curious, um, I can't recall a very detailed treatment of uh, a kind of Islamic theological question that, um, you know, arises in these sorts of contexts. So uh, I want to compare it with Sherman Jackson's uh, fascinating book uh, on the problem of black suffering, um, which covers, again, a very similar sort of moral dilemma. Um, and he um, is uh, a lot more sort of, he, he doesn't uh, show himself to be very directly um, uh, implicated in the debate in the way that you point out in the beginning, you know, you're a white male and you're a Muslim and therefore there are two traditions through which you are an inheritor of slave ownership. And he, of course, uh, being an African-American, is more likely to be at the receiving end of that tradition. But he doesn't, uh, in my recollection, you know, make such a big issue of it. And he presents the four. Well, sort of also, like... you know, for all we know, his ancestors owned slaves, too, in Africa. I mean, so right, what's interesting right, right. is if you look in, I mean, look, I'm not 
you know, I'm, I'm happy to admit my more immediate guilt in any number of issues. But right. I mean, what's interesting about this is that, you know, human history is one in which all of us are descendants of slave and slave owners, probably, I think, right? Yeah. At some point or the other, yeah. And I, I think this is what's fascinating for me, um, because you, you know, we also have these kind of DNA tests that you can do. I don't know how accurate they are and what scientists think of them, but they show us as being all deeply intermixed as a kind of human society. So my, my question, uh, I went on a bit of a digression, but my question is, from the Ash'ari perspective, to a certain extent, you know, this is a question of tahsin and taqbih, right? You know, what is moral evil? And this certainty that we have in the modern period, I'm just speaking sort of obviously in sort of theological theory here, but these certainties that we have in Ash'arism, it's like, wait, we don't actually have any moral certainties. And so I, I wonder if that's something that you reflect on in the book. I cannot recall that being a particularly sort yeah, of salient feature. Yeah, so I talk about that. Um, now, it's interesting because there's a, uh, there's a prominent Muslim scholar in the West whom I have a lot of respect for, so I'm not going to name this person. Uh, I'll just say that uh, they, you know, this person wrote in several of their books that that uh, Qadi Abdul Jabbar, the famous Mu'tazili Shafi scholar, died uh, 12, 1025, I think. Of the right. Um, that uh, he says that uh, s- slavery, riq in slavery and something like that is uh, it's a kind of morally evil and intrinsically in and of itself Hmm. now uh, he never says this in his books Uh, by the way that that scholar never gives the citation right i looked through this book and also so did sharon jackson and he never says this in fact god the al-jabbar says the opposite now if you're a mu'tazilite there you cannot the things that are allowed by law by god have to also be morally right Hmm. so the the um, things are you know the, the the relationship of like exactly how things are right and wrong in the world is another issue. But the point is that things are right and wrong in and of themselves in the world, right? right? And there can't be contradiction between that and what God says. So God, for example, can't say murder somebody because murder is wrong. Hmm. Now, for ushery, you, for an ushery, you could say God could say murder somebody because the definition of just is what God says. Hmm. Now, from Mu'tazla, so called the Al-Jabbar, if you're a Mu'tazlite, he can't say slavery is wrong. Why? Because the Quran allows it. So he says, in fact, he says, the fact that God allows slavery means it has to be Hassan, has to be good. Right. right. Now, yeah. um, what? so Muslim scholars never... Pre-mo- no pre-modern Muslim scholar that I know of, nor could I conceive of them doing this, ever mm-hmm. said that slavery was evil in and of itself. Right. Okay, remember, by the way, except for those people I said earlier, nobody said this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, not just a Muslim. Yeah. Now, why, but what, what, what would they say? They always, they, though, acknowledge it was harmful. There's two mm-hmm. things. One, in Islamic law and Islamic theology, Mm-hmm. humans are born free this is not a muslim invention uh, roman law also said that hu- the default status for human beings is freedom if a human just flops out of the ro- womb all things being equal that person's free right okay right. um the the difference between let's say us and the romans is that the romans said there are certain ways that you can legally be enslaved this is the same thing mm-hmm. islamic law said right right now um the to the it's the default of human existence is freedom. And Muslim scholars were also clear that only God owns our freedom. God owns our freedom. But God can allow certain situations in which people can lose their freedom. Right. They can lose it, let's say, if they commit a crime or something like that, right? right. Or in the Quran and the Sunnah, if you are a non-Muslim outside of the Islamic world and you get captured in a war with Muslims. Right. And the Muslim can take you and they can keep you as a slave. I mean, losing no, freedom, the, forgive me, losing yeah. freedom uh, because of a crime uh, is not something which is in the Islamic tradition. Quite yeah, it's, it's not, not, but I mean, it, yeah. we, Muslims yeah. use pr- prisons at various points in history. So right, right. The point right. is, they, they take somebody, they put someone in a prison, and we would say that is not being free, right? Right. Um, right. But, so, 
Uh, and by the way, it's interesting that, you know, when, when Muslim scholars talk about this kind of legal theorists and moral or moral and legal theorists talk about this, they uh, freedom and slavery are controlled by the state. They're held hmm. by the, the ruler, the government. As uh, almost like um, in lieu of God. So just like the sultan or the government can have you executed if you commit a crime. Right. Like they're the ones who hold this right of God. They also hold the right of God in terms of freedom. So, so uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so when when let's say you know Ahmed the Muslim owns a, a slave in Cairo in 1500, it's not act, so. Ahmed the Muslim owns the right of using that slave. The actual mm -hmm. freedom and slavery status of that person is held by the the, the government. Fascinating. Uh, but yeah. that's that, that never. That, I mean, that's why, for example, the, the government can say you're mistreating your slave. I'm going to make you free the slave, or I'm going to take the slave from you, or something like that. So there's this right. oversight based on the 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 same way that the Prophet Salam, would oversee, um, uh, like if someone came and said this guy stole from me, or this guy mm -hmm. murdered my cousin, right? Right. Um, now, so the, Muslim scholars never said that slavery was evil, hmm. but they did say it's it's unnatural. And by unnatural, I don't mean like it's it's like incest or something. But I mean it's unnatural. Hmm. Is it's it's not the natural state of human beings. Right. Something has to happen to you if you become a slave. Sure. Now, but they also said it's harmful. It's it has darar. Darar means harm. Right. Why is it harmful? They say this very explicitly. You can't do whatever you can't make your own decisions. You can't do whatever you want. You don't get to benefit from all the fruits of your labors. Right. You're not a complete legal person. So, for example, in most schools of law, slaves can't own property. Some hmm. schools of law, slaves can't lead prayers. Some schools of law, slaves, you know, um, couldn't be a witness in court. So you're not a complete legal person. So the reason right. why freeing a slave is good. And and by the way, I don't know of any source scriptural tradition or work of thought that is as obsessed with emancipation as the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet are obsessed with emancipation, with emancipating hmm. slaves. Hmm. Um, so why are they so obsessed? Because Muslim jurists would say, or legal theorists would say, slavery is harmful. Hmm. And so you're, but there's a difference. The harm for them did not outweigh the ownership right of the owner. Right. Right. Um, now, someone might say also, like, wait a second, you said the Quran and the Sunnah are obsessed with emancipation. Well, why didn't the Quran just say slavery is prohibited? Right. Because nobody said that. No society that had slaves, which is pretty much every society, certainly every civilization, hmm. ever suggested the abolition of slavery until the early modern period until the 17 until really the 1700s and 1800s right um why is that i mean that's another issue we can talk about i don't know if you want to i, I wonder about if anyone ever sort of uh what other traditions prohibited alcohol for example um in the pre-modern tradition Oh, uh, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I, mean I, sure. I, know, I know prohibition took place in the United States, but that's kind of a modern state kind of um, effort. But it would be an interesting comparative exercise. I mean, so so yeah. the, the thing is that, you know, some people say, well, why, you know, oh, the Quran didn't prohibit slavery because it would be impossible. Right. Well, I mean, it was difficult to prohibit alcohol. It was difficult to prohibit polygamy. I'm mean, sorry, to, polygate, uh, to prohibit po polytheism. Yeah. But Islam did that. Right. Um, in addition, it's possible, right, that the, the Quran or the Prophet could have said, look, we can't prohibit this, but this is wrong. Right. But they, right. Don't, they don't say that. But the point is that I think the reason why, and just to make a slight digression, but I, I'll tell, I sure, think it, sure. it makes sense, which is but one of the things that I get emailed every, not every day, every about once a week, once or twice a week, I get an email from somebody saying, I can't understand how people in past allowed sleep. Hmm. Fascinating. Right. That, you know, and it's always a, causing them great consternation, right. anxiety. So, I mean, this is probably because I'm a professor and I think about all this stuff all the time. For, and you've written a book about for, it. <laughs> but I, what, 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 I, what really interests me is how, not how could they have thought it, hmm. but 
why is it that I don't think that? Hmm. Right. So, I mean, if we're looking hmm. at kind of humanity, if you like, everybody in humanity who's ever lived, get them up on stage. You've got Aristotle, Buddha, the prophet, Moses, you know, everybody. <laughs> and you say, okay, everybody who thinks slavery is evil you know, intrinsically in and of itself, go over here. And everyone thinks that slavery is not evil intrinsically in and of itself, go over there. The people who think it's evil are going to be very, very small. And they're going to be from a very specific time and place in human history. Hmm. Hmm. So here's the thing. What is what do those guys not have hearts? I don't understand. Hmm. These earlier hmm. people, they just don't they're like dysfunctional. Their hearts don't work. Their brains don't work. I don't get it. How can they not feel the way I feel? I think that forced us to ask really what are the does our revulsion mean how do we think about morality right how do we um it's not a problem for example for us to say we don't we think slavery is wrong because slavery is not really an issue today right. Right, right. uh it becomes a problem when we want to talk trans historically about all morality being the morality that should apply for everyone throughout history can i interject briefly here i mean yeah. this is another point where you know, um, you're a historian. Um, I, I was trained as a historian in my undergraduate years. And one of the things that's kind of drilled into you is, you know, don't think anachronistically, right? Don't bring your own moral universe up to bear upon the people you're studying in the past who, you know, as Quentin Skinner sort of famously put it, witchcraft made sense in medieval Europe, right? Um, or I had the good fortune to study with Jeff Stout uh, at Princeton, who's a, a sort of relativist and pragmatist. And also, we have the phenomenon of postmodernism, which questions fundamental truths and, and beliefs in objectivity and moral truth as well. And so, I, I, you know, this is one of the things where I found uh, fascinating. You have this paragraph, um, I think, towards the introduction where you say something along the lines of this is one of those topics where whoever writes it, they feel compelled to say, and this is wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes me wonder that actually this is one of those areas where for all our sort of commitment to sort of secular secularism in, in the modern academy, there are certain sac sacred points which we cannot, you know, really just disregard and think. Actually, you can be nonchalant about that point. Um, and uh, no, you actually have to take a moral position on it. Otherwise, you're not a, a member of our civilization, so to speak. And, yeah. and I find that fascinating. So I, th I think that's historically, anthropologically interesting as well, to be honest. Well, I mean, also, you can look at that with other topics as well. So if you said, you know, like different notions of truth, so there's like the coherence notion of truth or the correspondence notion of truth. I mean, there's some people who say, like, truth in the past doesn't exist. Like, uh, narratives of the past are just things that make sense to a community. Right. Now, if you look at these debates, usually what someone will then say is, well, if, so are you saying the Holocaust didn't happen? And then you're like, well, I mean, OK, yeah, obviously, the Holocaust. Happened. So there's certain I mean, I'm not yeah. I'm not making that up. That's actually what yeah. if you look at some of these discussions, you, that's how yeah. the discussion plays out. Yeah. So yeah. the things that are the fixed points, the dogmatic underpinnings, if you will, they are I find interesting. They're usually things that are recent changes. Hmm. So, like, if you look at in, in, in America, I think probably in Britain, too, what are the two things that you just cannot say? You can't support slavery and you cannot support pedophilia. Interesting. Right. Interesting. Now, Interesting. by pedophilia, we mean like sexual interest in people that we legally today would consider children. Right. Under 18 to minus. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I just saw this thing yesterday about like some listicle about uh, we should stop thinking that these people are great. They were actually horrible. One of them was Charlie Chaplin because he would have all these sexual relationships with 16 and 17 year old girls. Although the age of consent time was 16. Right. But the point is you know, like he was garbage. He's awful. So but if you think about these two issues, the, these are two issues I think I would say they're maybe the two things that you really just they're sort of like uh, taboo. Hmm. There are two things that have inverted very recently in human history hmm. until very recently in human history. Slavery was totally normal and uncontroversial until even more recently in human history. A man having interest in a like a, 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 a nubile 
14 year old would be it wouldn't be a debate. There's a great book on this called American Child Bride by a guy named uh, like Styrit is his last name. Right. American I mean, Child there's, Bride. There's a major campaign in the U.S. at the moment, as far as I understand, to change the laws because you yeah. can still get married. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, as minor. So, but the the point is that you know, the thing is that, and this is I always use this example with my students. I say, look, if I told you that, um, a guy was brutally murdered, outside of campus, a week ago, brutally murdered. They'd be like, oh, that's terrible. But if I said, okay, a guy we could go, he uh, lured in this a 10-year-old girl, and then he had sex with her and ran away with her. And the students are like, oh, you know. I mean, even me saying that right now, like I feel yes. like kind of disgusting <laughs> feeling my stomach, right? Yes. So you're like, oh, like, that's like, that's messed up. You know, everyone's quiet after that. No one says anything. But if you look in human history, all all societies think murder is wrong. All societies. And hmm. I think pretty much every society would say that just randomly going up to a person in the middle of the street and bludgeoning them to death is wrong. Right. I mean, it's right. it's it's absolutely moral wrong Yeah. throughout time and space. Hmm. But in terms of the societies where the second thing is would be wrong, the minority of human societies in our history... Even today, places don't have some places don't have a problem with that. So why is the thing that is actually yeah. much I think, less... I think the luring component of it would be, I mean, in a lot of pre-modern societies, they would say, okay, well, if it's done in conjunction with a conversation with their parents, then it's okay. Or even if okay. you read Jane then, Austen then let's, and things then let's like say that. It's, let's say it's yeah. not a, let's say he doesn't lure. Let's say he, her Marries. dad agrees. Her dad yes. agrees. Yes. <laughs> I mean, these yeah. things in Yemen that people talk about, the, the parents agree to it. Right, right. Okay, so, but my, my point is not, I, mean, I think the point still stands, which is it's, a, it's our reaction that we feel in our stomach. Why mm. is our reaction stronger to something that is actually much less agreed upon as wrong in, by our species mm. in history? Why is it less fierce reaction to the thing that actually is agreed upon by our species in history as an absolute moral? That's what I find. So, what is, we get to think about, like, the things that where we feel the gut revulsion are usually mm. relatively recent moral changes, mm. right? Yeah. Um, so that, I think, is an interesting way to think about the relationship between moral right. revulsion right. and, right, and, and, like, kind of anachronistic or trans-historical notions of morality. And and there, uh, there's another dimension, if I, I mean, like, some of this stuff is uh, really dynamite thinking, <laughs> talking about it, but obviously we're engaged in a sort of reflection, uh, which is an intellectual exercise here. We're both respected, inshallah, I hope I am a respected academic. We're both respected academics, inshallah, and, um, you know, uh, reputable universities reflecting on a question which is, you know, um, intellectually significant. Um, by the I way, think, this is the same. This is the same debate that yeah. the same problem that Christian, Christian tradition has, Jewish tradition has, yeah. Buddhist tradition has, Hindu yeah. tradition has, no, right. moral, uh, natural law thinking has, uh, 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 Kantian philosophy has. Kant, right. by the way, read his stuff on uh, race and slavery while he's writing the categorical imperative. Fascinating. You know, or what's a universal discourse on morality? Yeah. I forget what it's called. Like you know, he he's same thing. He's saying there's certain. Africans and uh, yeah. Native Americans, yeah. you know, they're so lazy. He says that they're yeah. so they need to be enslaved in order to be productive. Yeah, yeah. Liberal so, luminaries like uh, John Locke, as you mentioned in the book, um, exactly. But the John Stuart Mill, liberty. John Stuart Mill, and the uh, colonization of India and civilizations and their knowledge and things like that. Yeah. So the the point is that, yeah. and another thing is, I mean, it's interesting. Like, the, you know, who I I talked to so many people about this issue when I was writing this book. Hmm. And the the conver there's two kind of conversations. One con hmm. first conversation is people just get completely disgusted and freaked out, and they can't <laughs> deal with it. That's the normal response. Right. Do you know who I can? The, the people that consistently I have the best discussions with this with African American Muslims, hmm. without a doubt. Hmm. Because I think for a lot of Muslims, they don't want to deal with this, and it hmm. freaks them out, and they get hmm. really uncomfortable. Hmm. I think African American Muslims. This is like. Day one, they have to think about this. Absolutely, absolutely. And they, this is something that is like, they, 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 they wrestle with it. Right, 
right. and they they have to come to terms with it or or not right but the point is it's not something they can uh kind of uh, put under the carpet so yeah for when i was writing this book and in terms of feedback i got on it, it was the it was from african-american muslims were by far the most productive discussions this that reminds me actually i have a good friend uh, amanda thomas johnson who's you know going to be starting up actually a phd at cornell he's recently written a book um uh, you know he's he's actually the descendant of slaves who were taken from africa to the caribbean and you know then he moved uh, you know uh, his family moved to the uk at some point probably part of what we had as the windrush um, generation so to speak um and then uh, he converted to islam so he's he's actually um you know a, a convert muslim and um i i we've had brief discussions on this but uh, to be honest, I mean, they are some of the the more the deeper, more meaningful conversations I've had where, uh, you know, I, I uh, for what it's worth, I recommended your book to him uh, because I thought he was saying that, you know, this is a dimension of the Islamic tradition that he was less familiar with. And he wanted to really think about and explore because of the moral sort of complexity of the issue for, you know, his own personal um, heritage. And um, and I think that, that, you know, that's something which I hope uh, to bring him on as an Islamic author at some future uh, juncture and perhaps in part discuss some of, uh, although his own book is on a, a different theme. Um, I mean, this is uh, really sort of like, there are so many threads in this conversation that could be taken up very fruitfully. I wanted to perhaps home in on, um, you know, this... Uh, uh, one one element that you kind of mentioned in passing, there, there's there's a lot of uh, material covered in this book, but I was just thinking about sort of the modern condition of uh, what Marxists call wage slavery, right? So, um, you know, there are all sorts of um, forms that we experience in, an, uh, in a given moment in time, in a given moment in history, that um, given the nature of, you know, uh, modern liberalism and, in a sense, a progressive understanding of how history morally progresses, so to speak, uh, we can come to an understanding that potentially actually the way we're living right now may be seen 100, 200 years from now as completely morally abhorrent as well. So the forms of you know employment that we have. And I wonder if you have had the chance to sort of explore any of these um, un, uh, in, in your sort of broad reading for this project. Uh, notions that debt is a form of, you know, a bondage. In fact, of course, we had debt bondage historically, but, you know, the fact that we all are going to university in massive amounts of debt um, and we're then, you know, getting a mortgage, <laughs> so to speak, which will, you know, again, embed us within a system. Uh, you have this uh, quote from the Matrix, uh, you know, in, in the text where you're saying that we're all ultimately slaves to the system. And you say that obviously that's different from being owned by someone. Um, but uh, you also have these fascinating anecdotes of slaves in very good conditions historically. Um, uh, one of my teachers, Sheikh Muhammad Akram al Nidwi, um, once commented that most of the caliphs in Islamic history were actually children of slaves. Um, and uh, because, you know, uh, caliphs often had concubines, and these would be uh, the, the sons of concubines who would, mm -hmm. of course, by giving birth to. A slave of their, uh, sorry, a child of their master would thereby be freed upon their, and and potentially become extremely influential figures behind the throne as well. So you know that that sort of like multi-layered nature of slavery. Uh, I wonder if you can comment on it. Um, you know how how it's difficult for us to really sort of have a uniform understanding of slavery. Yeah, I mean, I think that the one of the the challenges is that, is that slavery is both a, a metaphor and a a legal concept, right? So, um, and some, and sometimes those legal concepts and the metaphor overlap, uh, but uh, a lot of times they they don't. But they can be kind of invoked, right? So there is no since 1926, basically, or let's just say 196, let's say 1980, the last possible date. There's no legal slavery in the world. There's no slavery in the world. There's no slavery. Mm -hmm. If you define slavery as a legal category that is acknowledged and can be adjudicated right there's no no slavery in the world right um now you know the question is how you define slavery so one way is to say well it's a someone being property of another person another way you can say is somebody who's not free but then things like property and freedom uh really only make sense inside a, a consistent or coherent legal or moral tradition 
because if you look at kind of humanity as a whole throughout history, what is property? What is freedom? There's no property, just somebody has a right over something else. Some rights. That, that's, hmm. Freedom is the ability to do what you want, except when you're not allowed to do what you want. That's the, the definition. <laughs> so, I mean, like these are, it makes no, it's, it's meaningless trans historically. Can I interject uh, on one? Yeah. On the point of there being no legal slavery, doesn't the 13th Amendment leave a kind of space? Um, in the uh, no, States? because I mean, people who are, who are prisoners in prison, I mean, this is a, this is the big debate of the yeah. 13th uh, movie, the, the 13th, right, is that uh, slavery can uh, continues by uh, another name, right? Right. Um, but you're not the people in prison are not slaves, right? Right. They're, they're, not, not, they're not owned by the state. They're yeah. not on. They're not. They're still free people. They're just in a mm. uh, in a prison. Right. So now there's a great book if you're interested. There's a, called The Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman, which talks about the way that, especially in the South, uh, uh, you know mostly black men, I mean, you know, 100, 200,000 black men between 1865 and 1920s or so would basically get arrested for like, oh, you're loitering by the 7-Eleven. It's like, right. you, you come to come to like, OK, you're you're guilty of vagrancy. You need to pay a fine of one hundred dollars. I don't know. dollars. OK, you're going to prison. Like... Oh, and now, by the way, before even anyone can find you, I'm going to give you to this company. I'm selling you to this company up in Pennsylvania to build railroads. You're going to go get worked until you die and then they're going to bury you next to the railway that's it. it's 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 ridiculous so but the, but that person is not legally a slave hmm. so that's my hmm. my i'm not right. saying that right. you can't have a continuation of exploitation or coercion right. or whatever right. but right. that so my the, the 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 third way to think about slavery is, is slavery is a sort of a, a coercive relationship um a relationship of exploitation um a asymmetrical relationship of dependency or uh of or expo or exploitation um this is where you get what you know thought of as like modern day slavery or uh new abolitionism which hmm. really starts to get articulated in the uh, late 1990s right and um it, it really works along the idea of slavery as being a, a, co a coercion so it's coerced labor with essentially no um uh remuneration Right. Now, uh, the problem here is that what's coercion, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you look at a lot of the the major writers on modern day slavery in the 1990s and the 2000s, and they write about prisoners, they say, look, if you're in a gulag in North Korea, yeah, you might be a slave. Okay, But if you're a prisoner in the UK or the US, you have right. work you can do, you're, you're, you, can, you can choose not to work if you don't want to work. Um, then you're not a slave. OK, mm -hmm. but now think of but the whole movie 13th and the whole idea of prison as a, uh, you know, this sort of uh, carceral slavery is that is is now much more accepted. And a lot of those authors, at least one that I'm thinking of, is now it says he's, he's reconsidering the issue. What's That's changed? Nice. The conditions mm -hmm. have not changed. Mm -hmm. Conditions have not changed. It's just right. about what are we comfortable calling? So that's why this idea of a uh, what is that slavery in a lot of ways this is a political definition right what now here's the thing what coercion if you are in if you okay if you're in a federal prison in the united states federal prison you have to work mm -hmm. you don't have right. to but if you don't work you're going to get what you're going to get put in solitary confinement you're going to get denied access to the canteen and the food, prisoners usually don't serve food after about 5 30 p.m so right. okay no food from 5 30 p.m to like 7 a.m right they can deny family visits no family, solitary confinement, starving you to death. That seems like coercion to me, especially the, the UN considers solitary confinement to be a form of torture. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. it really like, what is coercion? A lot of people would, you know, a lot of Americans say, well, these people aren't being coerced. They're in prison. They did something wrong. They, you know, right. but if you right. look at what happens to you, if you don't work in prison, and then by the way, what, where does these workers in U.S. prisons, what do they, they've done work for Victoria's Secret, for other companies, even according to, to like modern, modern, you know, international labor organization uh, definitions of modern day slavery. U.S. prisons are places that have slaves. There's no, I mean, it's just prima facie, hmm. Hmm. per se, they are, uh, they are, there are people who are in captivity yeah. who are being farmed out to private corporations. Right, right, right. 
And as you say, the the film Thirteenth, which um, you know, I guess we'd both recommend. It's on Netflix um, to uh, for people to watch. Uh, illustrates very sort of um, very powerfully that, and and has created inaugurated this really um, serious debate uh, along with the, many of the scholars who are right, uh, speaking in it. They've of course been writing about these themes for a while. But here's the, the the problem. So let me interrupt you. But the problem is like there's, you can look at cases. There's a case called Celia Dean versus France, I think early two thousands. Another one called Queen versus Tang from the Australian High Court a couple of years later, and in, in both cases are basically people saying, "I'm a modern day slave. I'm being held in slavery." Um, in France, in one case, in Australia, in other case, hmm. and in the the first case, the the, the I think it's the European Court of Human Rights, if I'm not mistaken, comes back and basically says, "Look." Um, this person, it might be being treated badly, but they're not being treated like property. So they're they're kind of going back to this very property centric understanding of slavery. Right. Right. Very legalistic, formalistic understanding. Yeah. This in the Australian High Court case, they said, no. If we look at the the coercive relationship, we think this is slavery. Right. So you can see, even in a one decade or within a few years in the in the two thousand yeah. the two thousand teens. There's these two, still these two poles about what slavery is that are like p pushing and pulling against one another. And then it's like, you know, I remember, uh, OK, what the, you know, kind of like white nationalist people say, and I think this is even in the state curriculum, educational curriculum in some states in the U.S. They'll mm. say that actually a lot of white people were slaves, too, came to the Americas because they were indentured servants. Right. Right. Now, by the way, there's some That's crazy stuff. Like the year that uh, 1619, when Africans were first brought to the U.S. to America, uh, North American slave. Yeah. Same year, about I think 100 English children were brought from like the streets orphanage of London. Brought them right. here. Bunt, most all of them died. Um, but my point is, that some people say, well, these indentured servants were slaves. Now, someone would say. And it's a limited That's period of time, right? Uh, uh, indentured an, service, yeah, it goes yeah. for uh, through the 1700s. I'm not sure exactly where it ends. But no, I mean, uh, in terms of like, you can go into. Oh, oh, oh no, okay. You can sell I, so your it, services for you know to go to the new thing, world. another thing, right? So they'd say someone would say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! These people are not slaves. Hmm. This African guy is like out, you know, hunting, or his village gets raided. He gets taken, put on a ship, sent to Brazil. That's a yeah. slave." Right. And he's going to stay there for the rest of his life. He's going to get worked until he dies. Hmm. That's it. But these guys, uh, these uh, British guys, they went and they, they did. They agreed to do this. They say, I will give up certain freedoms of mine. Hmm. And even you can punish me. If I run away, you can brand me. You can hmm. chop my hand off. You can kill hmm. me. Right. But in return for my trip to the new world, I'm going to be your servant for indenture for 10 years. Hmm. And then after that, I'm going to get a piece of land. I'm going to go try and make my living. Hmm. Now, so those are very different. One is w one is unwilling and one is willing. Hmm. That's a good point. But guess what? According to, you know, things like International Labor Organization, other walk free, other anti-slavery organizations in the world today. Right. Debt bondage and indent indentured service is a major type of slavery today. Sure, sure. So what you see is you can think of it as like inflation of right. the term. Right. The term slavery is inflating, inflating, inflating. It's sucking up more and more things underneath it. Hmm. And in one sense, this is good because, look, if there's some guy who's getting treated badly in another country, well, we don't want that to happen. Yeah. So what's it? But if someone says, oh, he's a slave. Now, suddenly, like Bono is out there saying we got to fight for this guy's rights or whatever, you know, and then uh, everybody now this guy's life is better. That's good. Right. But at the same time, if you expand the definition, expand, 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 it, it starts to cheapen the suffering and experience of the mm. people who were actually slaves and when i say actually slaves i put quotation marks no, around that because yeah. modern day slavery is not a metaphor when people talk about modern slavery they're not saying it's like oh you're working my boss is making me work like a slave right they're saying no these people are actually slaves just like people 200 years ago were slaves mm. these people are slaves mm -hmm. but actually what we're saying when we we say that hey wait a second like, person in an American prison is not being treated as badly as a slave in the antebellum South. Hmm. What we're actually doing there is saying there's different levels of slavery, and that right. breaks the first, the second axiom, which right, is right. you all can't. Slavery, slavery. Yeah. You know, all, all slavery is slavery. So you start right. to, like, people start to get really uncomfortable, and the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of discursive system starts to break down. 
I wanted to, so I just wanted to say that um, there are quite a few questions and um, I'll, I'll be able to turn to them in just a moment if that's all right, uh, inshallah. But thank you everyone for putting in your questions and we'll put them to um, uh, Professor Brown in just a moment. I wanted to close with, um, you know, a reflection on what this all means for Muslims. So obviously you're writing both as a Western academic and as really a Muslim theologian thinking about um, serious uh, questions from a Muslim perspective as well and uh, you know I, I really like the way in which you blend those two traditions of uh, approaching the Islamic tradition um, uh, uh, in a very rigorous uh, uh, fashion. Um, in a sense the one of the major challenges and I kind of hinted at this when I was referring to Ash'arism uh, that what is the source of our norms right and what you're saying is uh, in the slavery conundrum that slavery is wrong. That's an axiom that we know. Slavery, slavery, slavery is wrong, etc. And it, you know, it, in a sense, is a disruption of that, you know, pre-modern Islamic moral universe where, okay, if you're an Ash'ari, norms are purely, uh, de you know, uh, given by God. Everything that humans do are completely contingent. They, in a sense, um, you know, uh, have no moral value whatsoever. Um, or you're a Mu'tazili. Um, you know, as, and, and there are other options as well, of course. And, um, you know, if something like slavery has been mentioned neutrally in the Qur'an, um, or, uh, as you know, in, in the case that you mentioned, which struck you so much when you had just converted, that was a neutral uh, mention. But in other instances, it's, it's, it's mentioned as something that is encouraged to bring, to bring an end to through freeing of slaves and so on. So uh, you can say there's a sense of discouragement almost, but it's not... I think neutrality is quite um, salient there. The Mu'tazila would seem to suggest, actually, you know, that's something which we cannot say is evil, right? Um, and I uh, sort of sent you uh, in a WhatsApp message just before our session that, you know, I, I, uh, this is a hadith, I don't believe it's mentioned uh, uh, in, the, in the book at all, but in Sahih al-Bukhari where Abu Huraira says, uh, you know, lil mamluki ajran, uh, quoting the Prophet that the slave has two rewards, and he mentions the rest of the hadith, and then he adds at the end, if it weren't for uh, the Hajj and you know taking care of my mum, I would have loved to die a slave, right? Um, and so there's a completely different sort of conception of what it means because for him it's like, uh, you know, a slave is getting a double reward, a reward for being obedient to his uh, God and a reward to being obedient to his owner. Despite all of the other harms that, you know, are recognized in the Islamic ju judicial tradition. And so in a sense, there's this moral sort of like uh, challenge that, you know, I would suggest that um, our modern circumstances puts us into this bind that actually you have to have this sharp, strong moral position on this question. But at the same time, you have a tradition which, if you want to be a part of, you can recognize there's even moments where certain members of the tradition, like Abu Huraira, are saying, actually, there can be a moral good, almost, involved in being in a state of servitude. And he almost says that, you know, I, I wish I was a slave, right? Um, so, yeah, that complexity. I wonder if you want to just comment on that before we go to the questions, inshallah. Um, yeah, I mean, by the way, like, you know, I'm not saying that, Abu Huraira was like getting this from Christianity or something, but I mean, like you see a lot in the Christian tradition, in the, in the gospel and in the, the the letters of writings of Paul and the gospels that that uh, Jesus is like comes in the guise of a slave, right? That the, the 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 Christian is like you know to 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 be a slave to to fellow to their fellow man, um, not just to God but to their fellow man. Um, uh, the way that saints like Ignatius Loyola, the way that they serve other people, I mean, they, they serve them like slaves. Uh, that's what they, that for them is this expression of piety um, or a way to train themselves in piety. Uh, I would say that, um, now, one thing that's important to remember is that, you know, usheries don't go around and say like, you know, um, uh, hey, Osama, like, uh, you know, you need to cook me dinner right now, Osama. You know, oh, what's wrong? You're offended by me saying that? But God never said, don't tell someone to cook them dinner right now. And there's, there's no right or wrong, except for what God can be. No, right. there's the, of course there's right or custom. wrong. There's what's called urf. Yeah. Custom. Yeah. And that's what people like, you know, when Ghazali and others write about this, that's where most human morality comes from, custom. And by the way, this is how Islamic law also 
we know this from one of the major five major principles or maxims of Islamic jurisprudence, al ad muhakkama or al ad muhakkima in another version. Uh, mm-hmm. Custom is probative. Custom is dispositive. Custom is authoritative. As long as it doesn't violate the Sharia, obviously. Yeah. But when yeah. someone says like, you know, um, like if, if I went and told my wife, hey, uh, where's, where's dinner? And don't forget to clean the dishes. And I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the Shisha Cafe with the with the boys. I'm going to watch the game. I want the kids put to bed. And I'm going to come. And then if I did that, I, I'll tell you where I'd be. I'll be outside the next second. The next minute, I'm going to be outside on my butt, like wondering why, how I flew that far out of the house in that amount of time. And then I'm going to get taken to court. My wife's going to say, this guy's a deadbeat dad. I want to be divorced from him. And if there was a Sharia judge there, they'd say, yeah, this guy's a terrible husband. Either, because either. I am not. But what determines obligations of husbands and wives is custom. Hmm. Right. So um, these are real. Custom is real. Custom right, isn't right, like, right. you know, oh, I don't know what to get Osama for his wedding present. That's not custom. I mean, that is, but yeah. that's like a silly form. Custom hmm. is like these deep senses of right and wrong we have. Hmm. Interesting. Right. And custom can change. So um, now th- th- that's really important to remember. Uh, the second thing you were talking about was i forgot now oh about the the um yeah so the hadith yeah Yeah. muslim scholars uh like the idea of freeing slaves was something that muslims did for pietistic reasons they wanted reward for god they'd say sometimes you have these documents of manumission where they'd say i do this hoping for my uh reward from god right? right um uh one of the things that people that Muslim scholars talk about when they start discussing abolition of slavery is some people are saying, wait a second, but then you're, you're taking away a major mm. good deed from people because they can't free slaves anymore. That's and we would say, what the heck are you talking about? Yeah. What? Are you crazy? Right. But that was a serious, like, for them, it was really important. The idea, the reward you got for freeing slaves is really important. Right. And, right. and that was a serious concern of theirs. Another thing that you mentioned, which I think was an important point, is this idea of uh, how we look back in time at the past. So, you know, people who look back, I just said, we look at this guy and say, are you crazy? Hmm. How could they not understand? Like, or or you'd see, for example, Muslim scholars who would say, who'd fight, they'd literally die. They would die. And there's examples of this. Hamdan al-Jasus is is a good example. Hmm. Moroccan scholar in the early 1700s. There's a the command, the ruler of uh, Fez, Maula Ismail, orders all people who are like of African descent, of slave descent in Fez and around it to be enslaved for his army. Hamdun al-Jassas writes a fatwa against this. He's told to shut up. He writes another one. He says, if you write another one, you're gonna, we're going to execute you. He writes another one. He knows mm-hmm. he's going to execute it. He gets executed. Right. He said, this. if you do this, this is a mockery of the Sharia. No one has ever said this in the past. This is absolutely unacceptable. Right. He went to his death, but mm-hmm. he, Hamdun Jasus, could care less if a Christian got enslaved. It would just be like, mm, okay. Yeah. So we would say, what, yeah. what's this guy's That's problem? Me. Why doesn't he understand? Yeah. But yeah. Look, if you look, read, like, for example, strict animal rights activists today, mm-hmm. they write and they talk about animal rights as abolition. And they, they're not saying that as like a metaphor. They, they're saying, look, uh, what is the idea that before there was an idea that you could take, let's say, African people and enslave them. Hmm. And other, you couldn't enslave a white person. Hmm. How is that any different from saying, I can take a cow and put it in a cage and take its milk and kill it and eat it. But I can't do that to a human. Right. They'd say that's just speciesism. They say it's speciesism. Right, right, right. And someone would yeah. say, oh, come on, that's ridiculous. But why is it ridiculous? A hundred, is say a hundred years from now, if we're, you know, all these animals are killed, destroying the environment anyway. It's it's totally un- environmentally unsustainable to eat meat. Yeah. This is true, yeah. right? So yeah. 100 years from now, we're all eating, you know, um, whatever, the unbelievable Artificial burger. Yeah. Uh, we, and we look back, we're like, what the heck was wrong with those people? <laughs> they didn't understand. Yeah. These animals have rights. Right. So, you know, the same way that our worldview makes sense to us, the fact that Someone in the past worldview doesn't make sense. So it doesn't mean it didn't make very good sense to them. Right. Um, I, I guess the, I mean, the, the final point, uh, uh, and it's up to you if, because we should really be taking some questions, but I was just um, thinking about the hadith of Abu Huraira, something 
along those lines if that's something which um, you know, how do we understand that in the sense that this is a companion, it's not obviously the Prophet saying you have this fascinating uh, quote, I forget the name of the scholar and it's very early Al Islam ila Al Hurriya. Oh yeah, that yeah. that's actually that doesn't appear till later. That appears in I think the earliest I've seen is in the twelve hundreds. Right. But there's earlier there's a it's a it's a hadith. It's probably not an authentic hadith, but it's something right. probably said by a companion or something that that God wants freedom. So that's why if you say if if Osama, if I'm if you're my slave and I say, uh, you're free, Osama. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just joking. You're not free. That right, right. us, I said you're free. Boom, that's it. Yeah. No, but I, I was joking. If we were making mm -hmm. a deal about me buying your car, mm -hmm. not that car you had before, by the way, which we won't get into. <laughs> the one you 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 picked me up with. For, yeah. with uh, right, let's say right. you know Finish your current there. car. Okay. Yeah. If I said you know we make a deal, reliable. I'm just joking. I'm not joking. That wouldn't be a legal contract because I yeah, know it yeah. was never my intention to buy the car. Yeah. But if I say free you and I'm it's joking or I make a mistake or something, boom, it's free. Mm -hmm. Why? God wants freedom. Mm -hmm. This is a what's the Arabic that goes, phrase that's used? Uh, uh, and who says uh, this again? Allah Yasha al Hurriya. Okay. Okay. Right. I think you can see it in the Kitab uh, Tahrish of uh, Dara al Amr. Amr. Right. Right. I mean, that's one of the earliest texts we that's have yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the Islamic tradition. Yeah. So um, anyway, so that that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a very important point because there, there's an obsession with, and it's, the irony is one of the reasons that there's so many slaves brought into Islamic civilization from right. the steppes of Russia, from Turkic lands, from Europe, from Africa, from India, right. Right, is because Muslims are constantly freeing their slaves. Right. Right. So they're they they're constantly having to um, replenish the labor supply because right. you don't have like a reproducing uh, self reproducing slave population. So th this is a, a point that you made uh, in your no, and I, I think we've referred to it briefly already, which is that uh, you know there was a, a capitalist imperative to get rid of slaves, and that's one of the things that actually um, there's a big debate about this. So there's a right. huge debate about this and. I don't understand why this is a big debate. You need to, in my opinion, this is my mm -hmm. opinion, but uh, if you, okay, you know, you're talking to like the Douglas Murray type guys and you start saying, or Christopher Hitchens or something, you start saying, right. the West sucks. The West isn't that great. <laughs> what are they going to say? What's their first thing they're going to say? Uh, you guys have slaves. <laughs> no, and <laughs> oh. you guys had slaves and what? And we... We Especially British people. What right, do British right. people always say? What are these like, you know, uh, Ni not Nigel Farage, but these uh, these other like uh, Winston yeah. Winston Churchill is great type people. They'll right, say right, we right. ended slavery. We ended slavery for the whole world. We went around and patrolled the oceans. So uh, the idea that Western Europe, that the West doesn't have slaves, hmm. is a is like a nail. I call it the natal miracle of Western civilization. And you can see this even in like, you know, French historians like Marc Bloch, who said that the, the disappearance of slavery in Western Europe is one of the most incredible phenomena in human history. Right? So there's this, uh, of course, it actually, I don't know if you can hear me. My camera is like, can you hear me right now? Yeah, I can hear you. I, I think your, your internet. I don't know why that happened. Weak. But the point yeah. is that slavery, enslavement of Europeans within Europe actually goes on a lot longer than people think. Definitely through like the 1200s in Scandinavia, and then mm -hmm. the enslavement of, um, of people from like North Africa, Muslims in Italy, like through the 1800s. Um, of course, we know about the slavery in the colonies, mm -hmm. but the my point is that the I, the idea that the West somehow is at this leading the leading edge. Is the the for the vanguard of freedom in human history is very important for like a Western self identification. It's, right, it's a founding myth of Western identity. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a big debate because when you come mm -hmm. in, here's the question. <clears throat> very simple fact, right? Mm -hmm. Something that essentially nobody in human history thought was wrong. Yeah. Goes from being fine. To being completely, absolutely unacceptably evil, essentially within 150 years. 
And what, what, how does that happen? I mean, do some people or people in the 1800s, are they eating more protein? <laughs> are they somehow smarter? Are they better? Are they, are they smarter than, than Thomas Aquinas or St. Augustine? Are they, do they more spiritually in touch with God than St. Augustine or than the Prophet Muhammad or Buddha or Moses and all these people? No. So what happens? There's I mean, the narrative, of course, to... it, it very often is about, you know, we've liberated ourselves from, you know, from our from, influences. But how, how yeah. I mean, where, where, look, where is this, uh, you know, in, in um, Renaissance, we discovered the Greco-Roman yeah. tradition. Yeah. We discovered Roman law, yeah. which allows, yeah. so if you look at the, uh, you know, um, uh, almost like Muhammad, um, either John Locke or yeah. uh, uh, my God, name is uh, escaping me right now. He could talk, our, our, the laws of our ocean. Yeah, then the, the, the dies in the mid 1600s. Major early our, our forerunner of human rights discourse, international law. Um, Hugo Grotius. Yeah, uh, exactly right. right. These guys, they're just operating with the Roman law tradition where if you there's there's certain there's legal ways to enslave people, which is you capture them. Right. Okay. Now. And in, in, it's really only in the 1700s, in the mid and late 1700s that you start getting like a real uh, this enlightenment rejection of slavery. Hmm. Why hmm. is that there? It, it's interesting. They're reacting to. Well, there's a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons is. They're reacting to the Atlantic slave trade, which mm. is horrific. Right, right. It's not only horrific, but it's it's racialized to the, yeah. it's racially based and justified. Right. And that doesn't, it really does not sit well with a lot of people like uh, um, with William Voltaire, Williams. with right. um, uh, um, these other names are forget, uh, escaping me right now. I can't believe I'm forgetting them. But the sure. um, the a lot of their reaction is against the Atlantic slave mm. trade. Mm. So. What I, I don't think you can say that there was this enlightenment because the enlightenment is a rediscovery of a tradition that had no problem with slavery. Mm. So what happens? What is it in human? Aristotle has a very prophetic line. I think it's in his politics. He says yeah, that yeah. they'll be slaves until looms uh, uh, move themselves. Right. Right. So like the yeah. what? What actually happened? When did when did slavery become? The, the sort of the ball start to roll and then gain momentum and really you hit a tipping point let's say in the 1800s right what's going on it's, in the mid 1800s you already have industrial revolution and, yeah. and it's not a it's not a coincidence that abolitionism emerges as it, is it first expressed and then catches on in the two places that had first industrialized and had gained extreme economic prosperity without reliance on slaves Britain, England, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the northern colonies of what became the United States. Fascinating. I mean, right? uh, I wonder... So there's a big... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I wonder if there's... I mean, you say this is very contentious and you kind of outlined some of the reasons why that might be the case, but um, I wonder if there could be pushback as there has been against Whig historiography for the last century or so, but, you know, with, um, I'm thinking, great divergence um, debates talking about, um, and, and you signal this in your book, the reason in a sense this becomes normal later on in much of the Muslim world is because economic development takes a while to get to those parts of the world in the way that capitalist development well, had taken place. No, but the there's another before. difference, which yeah. is that slavery in the Americas is, economic, is an economic phenomenon. Hmm. Slavery in the Islamic world is not economic. It's social. It's social. Hmm. It's hmm. a social that's right. why it's so hard to get rid of slavery in place, let's say, like Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula or something, because mm -hmm. it's not about like, I need this guy to I need these people to pick cotton in a way where I can make a profit. Right. They don't need that. They but it's how you think about, like, how do you have your people, mm -hmm. your retinue that you trust? Mm -hmm. King Abdulaziz has been served with the founder of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Who's the guy? Who's guarding him at all times? Mm. When he's praying, he stands behind him right. with a sword and a rifle right. at all times. Yeah. Right, right. What's his it's name? It's not his brother. It's not his son. It's a slave. Yeah, of course. Right. So there's this is a big uh, difference. Is it's when you have if slavery is economic phenomenon, hmm. and of course it also has social elements as well in the West. But I mean the point is if it's mainly economic phenomenon. Economic change will change the situation. Hmm. 
-hmm. If it's mostly a social phenomenon, you can have economic change and maybe the social uh, system doesn't change that much. Hmm. Um, right. I'll, I'll re I mean, I'm not trying to like, whatever, flog my own wares, but it's better. I'll, I'll just read this from the sure footnote. Thing. So then I don't, you know, make, uh, you know, make a lot That's of right. mistakes in, in re recalling right. it. Which okay, page is so this is a, a brief uh, 390 on the footnote. I'm talking okay, about. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, summary of the debate. Yeah. Eric Williams' landmark book, Slavery, Capitalism and Slavery, 1944, landed a mate. Okay, I talk about the moral awakening narrative. The moral awakening narrative is basically says uh, abolitionism happened. Abolitionism happened when human beings basically woke up and were like, "Holy crap, slavery is wrong." That's basically right. the narrative. Okay. The moral awakening narrative. Our, uh, he, he landed a major blow against the moral awakening narrative, arguing that Anglo-American abolitionism triumphed in ending the Atlantic slave trade in 1807 because the rise of free trade and industrial production, along with the weakening of mercantilism, meant that the agricultural industries that depended on slavery had entered economic decline by that time. Uh, in short, slavery was no longer part of a good business plan. In his 1977 response to this book, uh, Seymour Drescher, in a book called Econocide, showed that far from being in decline, slave-based agricultural production in the Americas had actually entered its peak profitability in the early 1800s, ending it was, quote, economic suicide for a major trunk of the British and American economy. Moreover, slavery was totally compatible with industrial modes of production. The moral awakening narrative had been right, in effect, says Drescher. Drescher and others since have argued that abolition was brought about by a major change in Anglo-American public sentiment regarding slavery, sentiment that ran counter to economic interests. Other scholars have tried to counter the Drescher School. What Williams had introduced was more than simply the obsolete or incorrect specifics of his decline thesis. It was the notion that in the end, that the end of slavery ultimately hinged on changes in material circumstances, not the idea of slavery as immoral driving history. They have offered several proposals for reconciling this economic narrative with Drescher's critique. Thomas Haskell argued that the peak profitability of slavery-based production was ultimately marginal in light of the major economic changes afoot on the world stage. So yeah, maybe you know things in the Caribbean had entered decline, but if you look globally, like economics was shifting away from a slavery model to one where you have to have workers who are also consumers, things like that. Right. I find Temperley, Howard Temperley's explanation, which I rely on the attitude most convincing. So Hem Temperley has a great argument, which he basically says both arguments are correct, the economic narrative and the moral awakening narrative, but mm. they cr they're they correct in the sense that they create a feedback loop. Right. So people are start thinking slavery is wrong because they're able to think it's wrong. Hmm. So, Osama, why don't you think? Like, you know, your family, some of your family lives in India. Uh, Bangladesh. Or Bangladesh. Okay. Yeah. You go to those families, you say, uh, like, uh, you know, like, I just took my kids the other day to, like, uh, a kind of the place there was chickens and lambs and stuff like that. Right. And a lot of kids, they say, like, hey, this is a lamb. I don't want to eat lamb chops anymore. <laughs> if you say that to, like, uh, Bengali or Pakistani, what do they say? <laughs> they laugh at you, right? <laughs> yeah, like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. You're a crazy person. <laughs> oh, you want me to die of starvation? Like, this is meat. If I get meat, that means that's, I'm actually going to have real chance to get develop a brain so these are luxury if once you have the luxury to start thinking about moral issues you start thinking about them and you can start um uh kind of coming to new moral realizations hmm. like a more refined morality so this starts happening in places where they don't need slaves northern united states great britain as they start to industrialize and then they start to see like wow we're actually doing things like we're inventing water wheels and we're inventing, uh, you know, steam power and trains. The world is changing. Suddenly the world is, is actually, you're, the world is something you can change. Progress mm. is happening. You're at the f forefront. We're getting better. We're the leaders. We're morally superior. Then you start saying, I can actually uh, express this moral sentiment that I think slavery is wrong. Ask other people to believe that. They can get uh, kind of join onto the bandwagon as well. And then economic change starts happening there as well. People don't need slavery uh, in other places as well. It catches on. It becomes easy to get rid of slavery. They become morally convinced of this. So the moral awakening, 
the, the beginning is economic change in certain places, mm. but then that mm. creates a moral sentiment that, cha- that changes yeah. and that, that creates part helps create more economic development. And it sort of like snowballs into this um, like a feedback loop. As I Although said. just in terms of the language that you used, I mean, the challenge for from an the Islamic theological perspective is to describe that as more morally refla- refined, partly because we look back yeah. at the prophet as a moral no, example. No, but it, 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 is more yeah. mor- it is more morally refined. I mean, think about this. So it's not about good or bad or better or worse. Hmm. So if you, um, like, w- how often are Muslims supposed to bathe according to the sunnah of the prophet? Like once a week is typical, right? Okay. Yeah. Sama, do you ever talk to anybody who bathes once a week? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Not. Like, if I meet if I meet someone, like I'm kind of an asshole. So I'll be honest. I'm kind of an asshole. So if someone I meet someone, I meet like, man, you stink. This not only do I t- I don't want to be around that guy. That guy is, I think he's a bad person. Right. So like we actually, it's we start to think like there's something wrong with this person. They're not civilized, right? Right, right. But there's nothing there's nothing yeah. morally wrong with right. bathing once a week. Right, there's right. There's nothing morally wrong with it. But you but that judgment comes naturally almost. It's yeah. because we th- yeah. this is. Because custom creates morality, right? So right. our, uh, w- but that doesn't mean I in mm. a I, not. I would rather die than say that I'm a better person than the prophet. Sure, I mean that's part okay. of your theological. I, I would you know, rather die than say I'm a better yeah. person than yeah. than than Omar bin Khattab or Ali right, bin Abi right. Talib. Right, right. But there's that's what I mean by more refined morality. It's not about being better. It's about yeah. having like your all, all these other issues are taken yeah. care of. Where are you going to yeah. eat? How you're going to sleep, your your health right. is taken right, care right, of pretty right, much, right. right? Now you're right. worried about these other things. These other things, these kamaliyat in the language of of yeah. maqasid al-sharia, the, tahsiniyat, the kamaliyat, right. the tahsiniyat, yeah. Yeah. become major issues. Yeah. So that's what I, I think is, uh, and, and by the way, I didn't yeah, talk that makes about sense. this, but yeah. all, is that that's why the, the you know the best argument in my opinion for abolition in the Islamic tradition is when you go back and you look in like a Shatabi and his. Uh, uh, Muwafaqat and things like yeah. that. Yeah. He says one of the, the, the not the main aims of the Sharia, but one of the aims of the Sharia is it freeing people, emancipating people. Fascinating. Yeah. So if we, if we are now in a position where we don't need, there's no economic need for slavery. Right. We can right. fulfill that right. mandate for emancipation by just right. getting rid of the whole category of slavery and fulfill right. one of the makas of the Sharia. This right. is an entirely Islamically legitimate. Right argument. Right, it's one hundred percent from within the Sharia tradition. Yeah, and someone yeah. could say, and this is often said, you hear this, well, you never would have thought about it if it hadn't been for Western abolitionists. <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. Western people would never have thought about it either. Nobody thought about abolitionism until it became economically possible. Right? right so right, right. Western pe- it just happens to be that the Industrial Revolution started in England and then mm-hmm. North America. West Northwest America. Sorry, northeastern yeah. North yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. That just it's not because Western people have like some kind of gene where, where like right. they read some book that makes them love freedom more than other people. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, yeah, this, this is interesting, of course, isn't it? Because you have the kind of more ideological historiography, which says that, no, precisely that, we're more freedom loving. But I, my impression is currently... Really? The, really? Well, I mean... Freedom loving for themselves. Everybody's freedom for themselves. <laughs> yes. But, they but no, I mean... They super freedom loving about like other people. Yeah, my impression is that the sort of more serious historiography now recognizes the contingency of, you know, where the Industrial Revolution ultimately took place um, due to various kinds of accidents of history. I'm Jazak Khan, it's really been wonderful and I, I feel very guilty sort of hogging all of the time because uh, there are a bunch Should of I questions. look at the questions? So, uh, yeah, so let, let me, if it's all right, I'm going to post them on the screen uh, and then we can read them out and then inshallah you can sort of... Um, so... Actually, so here's here's a question from Aisha Sayyid. I'm just going to post it if that's right. Um, it says, given that Islam came for the emancipation of all humanity and for liberating uh, from all bonds, demanding submission only to one true God, slavery and concubines is one uh, is one unanswered dilemma, especially for for the youth uh, who find who find this irreconcilable with uh, the benevolent image of our Prophet Sallallahu How can we tackle this? And I think. Uh, mm. You know, this is one of those questions that you have. Uh, yeah, I get this on. question a lot. I mean, I get a lot of emails like this. Um, yeah, yeah. So, look, first thing I would say is, yeah, and this is really like this is a really hard issue, and I, I would actually, I'm not trying to turn it around on this person. I would ask people to ask themselves, like, 
okay, it's not like I'm the outlier. We're the outliers. We have to explain why we feel a certain way about this issue. And then I guess this whole issue of changing custom and economics and everything like that and all the stuff that Osama and I just discussed. Now, um, so I, I simply don't think, I mean, I, it's, I, don't, I think it's factually incorrect. It is factually incorrect to say that um, having slaves or allowing slavery is irreconcilable with the beloved image, benevolent image of the, the prophet. That's, that's not true. That wouldn't be true for a Christian in the year 1600 or a Muslim in the year 1600 or a Buddhist in the year 1600, right? They just would not, this would not be an issue. Just like, by the way, even people who are trying to find dirt about the prophet's personal life to insult him with, which is, you know, essentially all the opponents of Islam, not until 1905 did any of them say he married Aisha when she was nine years old and that's messed up. Because they didn't care about that stuff. No one cared about that before. Okay. So the point is, the, the, what's changed is, is not, we have to ask, ourselves, what is, why are we looking at the, way, the world in a certain way? There's nothing wrong with the way we look at the world, as I said. There's nothing, we, you know, ending slavery and freeing slaves and improving people's conditions is, no one's going to debate that that's good. That's one of the aims of the Sharia. But that doesn't mean that it's, Impo that it should be impossible for us to imagine that people in the past didn't have as strong a reaction as we as we do. Now, um, another thing that's really interesting is slavery was a dilemma for Muslims, and you can see this in the Sunnah of the Prophet. But it wasn't a moral dilemma; it was a theological dilemma. Hmm. And this is a very famous hadith, right? So the the Prophet says in Sahih Muslim and other books. Don't owners of slaves don't say to your slaves abdi or emeti. Mm -hmm. Say hulami or jariati. Don't say mm -hmm. my slave or my female slave. Say my boy or my girl. Mm -hmm. Slaves, don't say about your owners rabbi, my master. Say maulaya, my my kind of my 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 sponsor or my patron, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because in the version of Abu Dawood, the one God is a Rabb who Allah. And you're all slaves. Hmm. So if a Rabb, the Lord, is God, and we're Ibadullah or we're Abid, we're hmm. all the slaves of God. Hmm. Hmm. How do you have a slave who's also the owner of another slave, who's a Rabb of another slave? So they, this idea of they don't, there's an anxiety about making sure that the, the relationship between God and human beings, between the Lord and the slaves of the, of the God, is not mixed up with the relationship between the slave and the owner of the slave. But uh, that's, there's, uh, so there's a tension there that Muslims try to uh, sort of push down or allied away by saying that this is, this relationship is not like a master slave relationship. It's a, it's like a patron uh, junior relationship. Although the person is owned, right? Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. So that, that's why I'd say it actually is a, a, a dilemma, but a theological one. And when, um, I, it's I interesting wonder, because, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I wonder if I could also mention, I mean, like there, it's a multi-layered tradition. Um, you know, I think we need to develop a historical consciousness to a certain extent because you have this beautiful appendix one, a slave saint of Basra, which I recommend everyone to read. It's just, you know, three pages, but this extraordinary anecdote about this kind of uh, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's a slave and um, yeah, and very poignant in many respects um, and uh, and so you know there are ways in which um, but it's not I just think, that right yeah. this other major scholar in the city two major scholars they they buy the guy and, and he's like why are you buying me I'm yeah. not like a very good servant yeah. he says I don't serve creatures and Allah al makhluk and right, right, right. right. I, ser I serve the creator. I don't slave creep. And they say, no, no, you don't understand. We want to be your students. They say, we, we want to serve you and be yeah. your students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, subhanAllah, because, you know, he... And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just such a striking story. I I, I don't want to necessarily ruin it. It's, it's a true story. It's not like this fictional novel that I don't want to ruin for you, but it's just, uh, it's really um, poignant, I think. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I get... Sometimes I, I personally think about this in historical terms, as you said, that, you know, there are these historical shifts that have taken place that give us these modern sensibilities that we don't need to deny and say, you know, there's, this is wrong and we're going to reject it. But that shouldn't also cause us to reject and deny the sort of um, the, the station of the Prophet oh, And so cool. And I think yeah. those two things are, um, you know... The, Honestly, I think it's healthier. Like, I, I mean... I think there's a there's something very unhealthy and unproductive and unsustainable about the way the the, the rhetoric, um, the moral rhetoric, is is working. And let's just take UK and America. You can just like if you say that. I mean, if you say that if you were involved in a slave trade, that you are kind of beyond repair, right? So, I, I'm not sure it's really healthy to have that view of our past, where that that that, that we um are so morally certain about things and black and white about things because i think that it it, it doesn't acknowledge the the like changes in sentiment right and i think that when you think about it more as like you know i can i'm trying to improve the people's lots as best as i can we are all trying to do that but that doesn't necessarily mean we're better than people in the past or that we have to condemn people in the past Hmm. That you, you stop thinking about in these like kind of morally black and white terms. I think it's actually more. And by the way, it makes it possible to, to think about your opponents as well. So you're a conservative or a Republican or a Democrat or a, a liberal, or, you know, labor. Stop being evil because they see the way the world in a certain way. And they start being, you know, someone who has different views about certain interests or certain priorities. Right. And you can that's someone you can negotiate with and deal with a lot better. I think you highlight in the book the the reason for this kind of uncompromising moralizing about this question which you know we we recognize and we see all the time but in a sense the abolitionists needed to project that in order to you know persuade everyone look we just have to stop this now and, yeah because uh, yeah. slave owners would say like look you're right this guy is a bad slave owner he treats his slaves terribly i don't do that you know right, right, right or right. or like look i understand you guys have legitimate concerns so you know what we're going to do we're going to make sure these slaves are treated well and then we agree okay so then it was in order, in order to, uh, to kind of make it something non-negotiable, they had to mm. make it non-negotiable. Yeah. I, I wanted to switch over to um, just uh, the remaining questions. Uh, Ibn Battuta 7 says, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. But uh, I you saw have a the other questions. I think a lot of them are, are, are I already answered. Yes, you've, you've already answered. So I'm, I'm just going to at least read them for the uh, sort of hope for. Uh, um, so that the, the um, their voices don't get sort of silenced, as it were. Yusuf Ali was saying, Islam does, uh, Islam, classical Islamic jurisprudence say anything about turning free people into slaves, and you kind of covered that. Um, I mean, in, in essence, my understanding is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, um, the only context in which you can enslave people, really, in the Islamic tradition was, um, you know, in, uh, in battle, right? And... You know, modern scholars basically said, and that was at the discretion of the imam, and so it's possible to even stop that. I, I really found fascinating this point you made that a lot of later scholars said, look, we cannot, um, you know, buy and sell slaves anymore uh, from outside because we have no way of uh, knowing whether they're actually legitimate slaves or not. And uh, I mean, this kind of goes in tension with uh, Hotel Udana's. Uh, remark which you commented replenishing slaves from the outside which was in a sense a socio-economic imperative I, w I wonder if you could briefly maybe comment on that yeah i mean so that the, the thing you're talking about is a relatively i mean it's not it's not a it's a minor discussion in the sense right. that it's not it doesn't have a big impact so they mm. don't but what they're saying is um if you are not sure that a slave has been legally enslaved should you buy them or not Right. And the the overall answer is, you pro you if you want to be careful, don't buy them. Mm. But bottom line is, you can because you're going to assume mm -hmm. that, like for example, Osama, when you go to yeah. Aldi's or whatever people go to, you know, you go to like the local store, you don't right. know where maybe this guy stole all the eggplants you're buying and right. all the cucumbers, right. Right? right? 
Right. You don't know. But we yeah. go around and we operate as if everybody is getting these legally because otherwise we wouldn't be able to buy anything. Yeah, we wouldn't so, be able to operate. Right. Yeah. So, so basically right. they're saying the same thing, which is that it's a theoretical like in general, thing. just assume that everything is unless you're if you know this person was not gotten illegally, you can't. And by the way, here they're not even talking about if they're a Muslim and they were enslaved, you, you cannot buy them. Right. Plus, right. That's it. You cannot buy them. Right. Right. You can't. But yeah. it, th that debate is specifically about was the Khumps tax paid? Because if they're someone went out in a raid yeah. into like Central Asian step and brought this guy back, right? Uh, that person should pay a tax to right. the imam, right? As part of the khums. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know they've done that, then is the has the person legally been so that's actually that debate. The other debate, which we see with like people like Ahmed Baba, and this is very common in the Maliki school of law, where there's you know, in, in, in the Sudan area, mm -hmm. Sahel area or in um, also in Central Asia, is uh, if you get someone who is uh, claims, to be, claims to be Muslim. Right. And there are the general rules also. If they say they're Muslim, the burden of proof is on the person who got them, who captured them or something. Fascinating. Uh, to prove that they're not Muslim, which is very hard to do. Yeah. And by the way, it's also important to remember that most slaves probably, most slaves probably were brought into Islamic civilization not through capture, but through buying them from... Mm -hmm. From, uh, slave merchants who right. brought them from some other place, who got them either be from some well, some way or the other. Right. And there's even a debate amongst Muslim scholars about whether you can do that because you don't know if those people have been legally enslaved. Right. But again, the, the rule that kind of wins out is like, you just assume that this guy got them legally. Yeah. And if it's c according to their crazy customs that they have, if that's yeah. all right for them. Yeah. Then you can uh, you can buy them. Yeah, I mean the the pragmatism of law uh, kind of wins out. It makes yeah. it makes sense legally speaking. Obviously, um, sort of it, it it's kind of like it it grates for the modern sensibility certainly. Um, I, the other sort of questions, as you mentioned, um, you know, we kind of had a discussion about someone was asking about abolition in the industrial revolution and the debate that you mentioned between Eric Williams and Seymour Drescher. But um, there's one last question. Um, which is it's an interesting one here um i would like to understand the wisdom behind dr brown locating being muslim and american as opposing identities in the introduction introductory part of the text and i didn't i didn't feel it was opposing but i'd, I'd be interested to yeah it's not opposing i think maybe yeah. i meant by that is that is that there are two kind of there are two i talk about the kind of you know american slavery conundrum and the muslim islamic slavery conundrum right they're similar but not identical but i mean right. In the case of, um, you know, I mean, so there, there, which is that as an American, you have this issue of the kind of the founding fathers and Thomas Jefferson, the same guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and um, which is a, you know, a very compelling document. And, you know, the guy had children with his uh, slave woman. Um, and then, uh, but the Islamic one is different, which is it's, you know, it's similar, but, you know, the Prophet Muhammad is, is not like Thomas Jefferson. I could say, you know what? Forget Thomas Jefferson. You know what? Take his statue down. I don't care. Forget about him. I mean, you can't. If you're a Muslim, you can't say that about the Prophet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're similar, but they're they're different. There's differences between the two. So I think I was more trying to say that they're two different kind of uh, uh, discussions. Their own, each with its own characteristics. Jazakallah khair. Now, this has really been. Um, uh, thank you so much for your time. I mean, an hour and forty minutes, and I, uh, I'm also grateful for um, all the questions that were sent in. I cannot encourage enough um, people to read this book. Uh, you know, go ahead and um, purchase it, inshallah, and, and have a read of it. Um, I think it's just um, a tour de force of so many different disciplines: a moral philosophy, um, uh, sort of wider epistemological questions. Um, I, I found the discussion on nominalism very interesting. Um, uh, you know, uh, history that is very wide-ranging. Um, and uh, do you mind if I ask how many books you read for this? Did you uh, you have a uh, a bibliography, a which is a select yeah. bibliography in in the text, but it's long enough. And uh, then I actually left out. I did yes. the bibliography is just books I cited in in the footnotes. Right, but right. I actually realized I left some out, which is kind of annoying. But the, right. the um. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I read a lot of books, but I was very exactly. driven, you know, and I did this. I was, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe this is the same for everybody. But for me, like when I write books, I become like obsessed. You know, my wife is like, this guy's going crazy. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't do anything else. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it, it's a very intense. It was a very intense experience. 
Perhaps in closing, I can just ask uh, what you're working on currently. Yeah, so I'm, you know, it's funny when I wrote this book, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm writing a book about slavery, but you no, know, I'm never going to write a book about race because that's crazy. I would never do that. I was, uh, not a million years. <laughs> and then, but the, the, which is, I, I actually still would say, but uh, then last summer there was this debate in this uh, case called Research Africa Listserv. Where a lot, there's this one thing called Afrocentrism or like Kemet Afrocentrism, and you see this. Um, it also kind of goes back to this guy, and I think his name's Chancellor Williams, and the kind of conservative Christian minister in the, in the U.S. in the early 20th century. This idea that like Islam is this, you know, Islam is sort of like has slavery in its DNA. Hmm. Muslims and then Arabs hate black. You know, Islam is anti-black. Arabs are enslaved black people. Uh, Islam is a colonial presence in Africa. It's not mm. really an indigenous part of Africa. So mm. I was, uh, and it basically it's all saying Islam is anti-black. So mm. I was really, someone asked me specific questions about things that had come up in this debate about hadiths and say, can you answer this, that, and this? Mm. So I started looking into it. Oh, okay, I'll look in. Started looking. And I was like, you know what? I, this, I need to, in order to answer this, I need to answer this bigger question. In order to answer mm. this bigger question, I need to answer this bigger question. So now I'm writing a book called uh, is, is Islam Anti-Black? And it's uh, actually it's getting close to being done. Okay. And uh, it won't be a big book. It'll be a smaller book. Right. But uh, that's fine. Mashallah. So, so actually directly connected to this book. I, I, I was under the impression that you were going to be writing on um, the uh, notion of siyasa and qanun. And, yeah, I have that yeah. book. It's like 90% done. But I, okay. I, can't, I can't finish it. Because you're distracted uh, by this project. Other stuff comes up. <laughs> Mashallah. Jazakumullah khair. No, I mean, I think um, it's it, it's a great service, actually, because uh, you your books are a great service on two levels. Of course, the academic community, but also, I think, the, the wider Muslim community can really benefit from these texts. And uh, it's really wonderful to have, like, someone who's doubling as that sort of Muslim theologian and uh, professor at Georgetown, so to speak. Um, so we look forward to that and um, inshallah I will definitely bring you back uh, you know when as and when you're available um, because I'd love to have the opportunity to discuss some of your other books um, so, but Jazakumullah khairan for your time today it's really been sort of wonderful to have you and I look forward to uh, inviting you back before long um, Jazakumullah khairan for everyone who's stuck around for you know nearly two hours at this point um, this has really been enlightening for me um, and I've benefited a great deal from also the questions that you're asking, um, Professor Brown. And uh, I hope you will join us in a week's time. Uh, and, uh, you know, inshallah, I'll, uh, I'll have another author we have, we're in conversation with, inshallah, at that point. My pleasure. Uh, uh, until then, Jazakumullah uh, khairan again, uh, Jack, and uh, we will be in touch uh, in the near future. Fi Assalamu alaikum. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.